You know, our prayer life, the prayer life for you and I as believers is the most powerful tool that we have against the enemy. I say that at least twice a month because I want to keep reminding us we have this tool in prayer, in a prayer life that can not only change our lives, but change the lives of people around us. When we pray and we pray, but we don't listen back to what the Lord is telling us, we don't get the fulfillment. We don't see the miracle. And God wants us to know that He answers every single prayer that comes before Him. God answers. Sometimes the answer is no. Sometimes it takes years. I've had answered prayers in my life that are 20, 30 years old. I think most of us can say that. So let's never take our prayer life for granted. Amen? There's a man, along with Matthias, who was mentioned one time in Scripture. He's mentioned in the genealogy of the tribe of Judah. Judah was was the, a son of Abraham that was uh, uh, known. He was a praiser. He worshipped the Lord. And in the genealogy list of the tribe of Judah, this man is men mentioned one time, and he's giving given rather a place of honor. He, it's an honorable mention in Scripture among six hundred other names of the people in the tribe of Judah. This man is held in honor above all the other 600 for one reason. And that's because he dared to ask and believe God for great things. He prayed a prayer that was so unique and different compared to the prayers that were prayed at that time. That that is what he became known for. He's got an honorable mention in Scripture, and he's only listed in two verses, not for anything he did specifically, but just because he asked God and he believed God for great things in his life. And I want us, as we read this Scripture in First Chronicles 4, 9-10, through 10, I want us to understand that we have the same power today. We serve the same unchanging God. First Chronicles 4, 9 and 10 says this, There was a man named Jabez who was more honorable than any of his brothers. He is known for his honor. He is known for his honor. God loves people who are honorable. The reason Jesus couldn't do miracles in his own town, in his hometown, is because they didn't treat him with honor. God wants us to be people of honor. And in today's world, honor has taken on a whole new meaning than what it is meant to, uh, in God's eyes. Honor. God holds in high esteem. He was, Jabez was more honorable than any of his brothers. His mother named him Jabez. Now remember, when they would name their children back then, a name was something that there was a lot of thought put into. Sometimes it would be a week or a month after the child was born. You, well, I should say a week, you know, to ten days before they would name him. They usually tried to get it done before the eighth day, but they took time to see and pray and see if there were any qualities in this child, and they would name him accordingly. A name was very important to the people of this culture at this time. That's why it was a big deal when Peter, when, when Simon, when Jesus changed Simon's name to Peter, because the meaning of the word Simon was reed. A reed was a, a plant that grew up in the water, and it was very spindly. And whichever way the wind was blowing, the reed would bend in that direction. It was very pliable. And Jesus renamed him Rock. Petros meaning the rock. Peter. Because Jesus took great, great consideration in the name. Jesus knew that Peter was not a man that would be bent whichever direction the wind blows that he was stubborn, that he was solid, that he was firm. 
And so Jesus named him the rock. Jabez means sorrow and pain. Let's continue reading. His mother named him Jabez because his birth had been so painful. For he was the one. He was the one. This didn't happen all the time. It was unique until Jabez. He was the one. Out of all the people that had been born, all the religious leaders, everybody in the church, for lack of a better word at that time, Jabez was the one who prayed to the God of Israel. And this is his prayer. Oh, that you would bless me and expand my territory. Please be with me in all that I do and keep me from all trouble and pain. And God granted him his request. God granted his request. To you and I, this prayer doesn't seem so out there. It's like, yeah, so we pray that all the time. Well, this was the knuckle. This was the turning point when people used to just, that was unheard of to ask God to bless you. At that time, all of the praise and all the blessing was heaped over onto God. You said, I bless you, Lord. I praise you, Lord. You wouldn't dare at that time to ask God, oh, that you would bless me. It seemed selfish to the people of that time. But Jabez, I believe, was tired of being labeled by his name, sorrow and pain, because he mentions in this scripture the third thing that he asked God to do for him was to keep him from all trouble and pain. So these three things, nothing that he asked for was outside of God's will so God blessed Jabez, and he granted his request. It was God's will at that time, if it was God's will to answer these requests, these prayers from Jabez back then, how much more would God today, under a newer and better covenant, love to grant us our requests and answer our prayers? The problem that we have is we have this singular point of thought. Sometimes when we have a need, we're fixated on that need and we pray for that need and we expect a miracle and that's the way it should be. But when it does not come to pass, we should not let that be a root of bitterness that grows up in our heart silently to where we think God didn't hear us. Because God does everything in His own time and God answers every single prayer that is prayed. Again, this is the only time Jabez is mentioned in Scripture. We know that he's a descendant of Judah. Now get this. The name Judah means praise unto God. That's what the Hebrew meaning translated into English means. Now the word Jabez again, in Hebrew, translated to English, means sorrow and pain. So one could say that the story of Jabez from the tribe of Judah is a story where sorrow and pain is joined together with praise unto God, and God honored him by answering his request. Whenever sorrow and pain is joined together with praise and worship unto God, mighty things happen in our lives. We need to take every trial, every tribulation that we go through, every bad medical report, every problem that we have, we need to offer God praise beforehand. The tribe of Judah, Whenever a war would break out, they would send the tribe of Judah in first. Before they went into any battle, the tribe of Judah was sent in first always when they were taking new territory. It's like God was giving us an example saying, you're not going to go anywhere that your praise and your worship hasn't gone before you. If we want to have victory over the battles that we're fighting, then we've got to send praise and worship unto God out first. I'm so tired of see, seeing people mad at God. How many have been there? I've been there. 
I was so mad at God when my dad died, I could spit nails. I literally stood on the roof of the hospital calling my family members to, to deliver the tragic news. And I shook my fist up in the air at God and I said, you feckless thug. I called God a feckless thug. How could you do this? This man served you his whole life. And you take him because of, of a mistake from a technician? Just a few months after he retired from 40 years in the ministry? I've been there. But I've come to realize in my own life through trials, people have told me this before, exactly what I'm telling you. And I just kind of, like some of us do, when people are talking about the Lord, it just we kind of listen to it. It goes kind of in one ear and out the other. Oh, that's great. But when it happens to you, when it happens to you, when you're the one in the hot seat, you start to realize that this, these words are true. In our darkest moments, when we come into the house of the Lord so heavy with a burden that we can't seem to lift our hands in praise, psychologically, emotionally, Mentally, we come in here where we've been many times before where we, we lifted our hands and sang and praised and our heart just sang to God and then we have these problems that happen and we come in and our hands just seem to be heavy. And after my dad died, I went to a Sunday service and I went into the sanctuary in that condition. It was a beautiful day. I wanted to go to the beach. Didn't want to be in church. But I went. First song came. Just kind of sang it. Na, 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 na. Began to pray. Starts with prayer. I began to pray. Lord, I don't like feeling like this. Pretty soon my hands are in this area. And I began to sing and worship God. The song we were singing, I remember it. It was, Oh Lord, you're beautiful. Your face is all I see. Pretty soon my hands are lifted. And as to clean me out on the inside, the tears began to flow. And I'm not a crying man. Only when I'm touched by the Holy Spirit of God, usually do the tears flow. And I began to lift my hands and as to wash me on, on the inside, the tears began to flow. And I got victory. Where I didn't, I went in thinking victory could never come. I'm always going to be mad at God for this. But victory came when I sent praise and worship out unto God. God gave me victory over the battle, the spiritual battle that I had been fighting. It's like God's telling us in this story. It's like He's He's saying, when you send the praise out first, every time, then I will begin to lift you up and out of your circumstance and lead you into victory. We need to get this spirit we need to get this into our spirit because before we're able to do the things that God has called us to do, before we're able to, to get away from the chains that the enemy has on us, and once we, we think about chains, we think about addiction, and we think about gossip and sin and all these things, but I'm talking about the chains of complacency in our Christian life. I'm talking about the chains of holding grudges, the chains of unforgiveness. These are all things that most Christians deal with. And God is saying, when you send the praise out first, then I will lift you up and out of your circumstances. Because Satan wants to keep us in our chains. Whatever he's shackled onto our hearts, he wants us to keep us there, to keep us from moving forward. 
He wants to keep the chains, the, the heaviness that I felt in my arms. I had a picture in my, my mind's eye of the enemy had shackles and chains on my arms, and I, that's why I couldn't lift them. Because he had chained me down. But once I began to, my heart began to praise God, those chains were broken, and I was lifted up and out of the circumstances. You know, a lot of Christians will never never get to the point in their Christian life where they receive this message. A lot of believers that are sitting in churches today, just merely religious people, they're good people. They're, they're, they're honest people. They go to church every Sunday and Wednesday. They do things for others. They're very good people. But a lot of those people have never truly learned how to bring praise from their innermost being. Bring praise unto the Lord. And that's why they seem to be unchanging. They're never witnessing. They're never on fire for God. But they're always at their posts. They're always in, in church. But they're never doing anything other than being in church. Because the enemy has had them shackled. They sit and they think, well, it's the, some people come and they think, well, it's the praise and worship team's job to, to bring praise. So they come with a taker's attitude. They come into the church with a taker's attitude. I'm going to let the praise and the worship team lift me up and out of my burdens and get me in the mood with a good song or something that I like to get me in the mood to praise and worship. That's completely backwards. It's not the praise team's job. It's our job. Some people come, they never pray, they never read their Bible, but they come to church every Sunday because they believe it's the pastor's job to feed them. It's not the pastor's job only to feed you because it's our job to feed ourselves all week long. It's not the teacher's job to feed the children the spiritual lessons that they do. It's the family. It's the father's job. It's the mother's job at home. You see what I'm saying? So a lot of people have it backwards because they haven't truly learned what this is saying. That if we send out praise, then God first, then God will lift us up and out of our circumstances. We have to stop looking at our praise and worship time as just a Sunday morning sing-along. Amen? we got to praise ahead of the miracle. Lord, I haven't received the healing yet. I'm still limping. I'm still afflicted. But I'm going to send the praise out to you anyway. I'm going to keep praising you. And I'm going to keep walking in the Spirit. I may go limping, but I'm going to keep moving forward and offering you praise. And I'm going to thank you in advance for my healing even before we get it. Lord, I want to thank you for my entire family being saved and in the house of the Lord, serving and worshiping you, even before I see it. And I'll praise you until my dying day, and I'll pass that mantle of, a mantle of praise on to somebody else if I don't see it in my life, trusting and knowing that you are going to bring it to pass. Amen? Yes. We've got to send praise out before we'll get out, no matter what we're going through. When we're willing to praise God, through the hard times, he'll bring us out. On his deathbed, Jacob called for his son, Judah. And he began to prophesy over him. Look what he said in Genesis 48, 49, 8 and 9. He said, Judah, your brothers will praise you. You will grasp your enemies by the neck. All of your relatives will bow before you. Judah, my son, is a lion that's finished eating its prey. Like a lion, he crouches and lies down. Like a lioness, who dares to rouse him? The name Judah, again, means praise unto God. Judah was a praiser. And what this verse is saying to me is that when we bring praise to God, it comes back on us. It's, it's a cycle. When we offer praise to the Lord, then blessings and power fall upon us. It completes a cycle. No matter how big the enemy is, according to this verse, when we praise, when we're a praiser, and we begin to praise God in a church service, in our car, wherever it is, then a hand goes out in the spiritual world and grabs the enemy by the neck. Amen? 
Too many, too many believers are stuck in this complacency. If we could see that true praise, just like prayer, is spiritual warfare. When we praise truly from our hearts, if we could see what was going on in the spiritual world, then you'd see the enemy getting grabbed by the throat and thrown out of the way. There's so many people that just go through the motions of praise. Psalm 47 tells us to clap our hands and shout. Clap your hands, all ye people. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. Yet I've got, I've had people that have sent me emails and, and talked to me and said, you guys get too excited and I don't get all the happy clappy stuff in the songs and I think it's all phony when you guys walk around and greet one another. And I say, keep coming. Pray before you come in the door. You're going to see that this is very real. This is genuine. We love one another in this church and we love to bring, bring praise unto the Lord. Amen? Churches that have a, a, an honest praise and worship service are like that crouched lion. In the spiritual world, we're like a crouched lion ready to pounce on the enemy, our, our prey. But there's too many churches that posture themselves as the prey. Too many believers that posture their life like they're the prey, like they're the victim of something. We need to be excited. Amen? When Jesus comes, when Jesus comes in all His glory and He comes for His bride, will we be ready? Will we truly be ready to go? I'd like everybody this week, if you could, to have some prayer time every day and spend 90% of the time in the quiet listening to what the Lord says to you. Take a little bit of time every single day, no matter where you are, put on a worship CD or a favorite gospel song and begin to truly worship the Lord. Block everything out and begin to send praise out to God, not for just for what He's done, but for what He's going to do. Send that praise out because a lot of people are stuck in a place and maybe they're stuck because they haven't sent praise out ahead of them and that's why they can't get victory. Jabez was given a name that meant sorrow. Can you imagine growing up in a society like that where you know everybody knows your name? It's like that translates in English as sorry. It's like... It's like they were saying, you're sorry. You're never going to amount to anything. But yet God elevated him in two verses of Scripture. Honored him above 600 people because he dared to pray, oh, that you would bless me. And I, that is what we should be praying from a spiritual standpoint. Oh, that you would bless me, Lord, and expand my spiritual territory. Father, I want to give you every aspect of my life. I want my children to come. I want to be a witness to my friends at work. Expand my spiritual territory. Oh, that you would be with me all of the days of my life. The hand of God, the open hand of God. Oh, that you would be with me all the days of my life. And that you would keep me from all harm. That that prayer seems so simple to us, but it's a very deep spiritual prayer. And I believe it was a turning point in the faith. Let's break it down. Oh, that you would bless me. When he said bless me, it's the Hebrew word barak, which means to congratulate. It's used a thousand times in the Old Testament. It means to, to heap, uh, heap upon, heap uh, blessing upon. But it's always used when someone is pouring praise onto God. I will bless, I will barak the Lord. Praise the Lord. It means to boost, to lift up, to heap honor onto. And Jabez understood that not only are we to praise and bless God, but we serve a God who wants to bless us. 
We don't have, we don't serve a closed fisted God. We serve a God who wants to bless us. And we need to get, uh, our, our, our life lined up to where God, to where we know that God has called us to this place. He has provided everything that we have. And we got to get to the place where we say, what do you want me to do with this? You've blessed me so much. What do you want me to do with this? God granted his request. The Bible doesn't say that God said, me bless you. Your name is Jabez. That means, that means you're a loser. I, I, I'm not going to bless you. God didn't say that. God loves to bless us and expand our spiritual territory. The second thing he asked, again, was for to enlarge his territory. That's progressive growth. This is what we should be praying for God. Expand my prayer life. Expand my Bible reading. Expand my witness. The third thing he asked for, for God to be with him in all that he does. Can you imagine if these children would start praying that prayer every morning with their mom and dad when they first get up every single morning, Lord, be with me in all that I do. What kind of life they would have. In God's open hand is healing. In God's open hand is salvation. It's power of the Holy Spirit. And Jabez is saying that he desires the personal touch of God, the open hand of God on his life all the days of his life. A lot of people achieve success in life. Now lean in. A lot of people get successful in life. God's been good to them. They're blessed. But they lose the hand of God on their life. I can tell you from experience, success is hollow and it's empty. No matter how many things you have, it's hollow and empty when God when his open hand is withdrawn from our lives, when we get so blessed with things that those things become our God and, and they take us away, the things that God provided for us begin to take us away from God and we build idols out of our stuff in our life, then God's hand gets withdrawn. We stay, we may still accumulate stuff. But when God's hand is withdrawn from your life, you can feel it in your spirit and no matter how much you get, you can't ever be fully satisfied. It doesn't feel, fulfill that need. We need to make sure that we don't allow God's blessings to become idols and that we start worshiping the gift and not the giver. Amen? What good is it to gain the whole world and lose your soul? What good is a pastor in a pulpit, standing in a pulpit, when, when the hand of God is not on his life. He just becomes a motivational speaker. The last thing that Jabez asked God for in verse 10 was to keep him from trouble and pain. And I imagine that he was thinking, Lord, they gave me this name. They expected me to be a loser. They expected me to be a failure. My, my name literally means sorrow and pain. But I'm asking you, God, to keep me from all trouble and pain. In other words, God, don't let me def be defined by my name. That should be our prayer too. Lord, keep me away from things that I need to stay away from. Keep me from becoming an embarrassment to you. Keep me. I used to, Brother Ron Koppelberger used to pray a prayer every Sunday and I loved it because he'd say, Lord, help me not to give you a black eye. He'd say, Lord, get yourself a good name through my life. That really blessed me. Lord, keep me from people who may influence me to do wrong. Lord, keep me from sin and pride and unforgiveness and bad attitudes. These are all things that Jabez is asking for. God, keep your hand on my life. Don't withdraw your hand from my life. Keep me close to you. We always think of things as evil and sin, like murder and 
and rape and addiction. There's all kinds of things that come to our mind when we think of those things. And it's true that evil, the enemy, is all sorts of demonic uh, demons and spirits, principalities and power in the air, uh, powers of the air. But it's also evil is also things like pride and backbiting, thinking we're better than someone else, thinking others are beneath us, thinking we deserve, uh, you know, a choice seat in the house. You guys remember that. And God granted what Jabez requested. He never killed a giant. He never did a miracle. His shadow never healed anybody. He just prayed a simple three-point prayer. And God held him in honor. Because I believe that God wants us to come boldly before the throne. I believe that God wants to bless us. I believe that God wants to the church at large, the body of Christ, to ask Him for an outpouring of His Holy Spirit. My prayer is that every believer it worldwide, but in America, that every believe in Amer believer in America would begin to pray for and expect the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The church is at a point where we're starting to die. The numbers are big, but just like we can feel the demonic energy in the world, in the spirit, when I look at the church, the churches are getting bigger and the entertainment's getting more uh, elaborate and, and bigger and, and, and uh, it's growing. It's starting to look a lot like the concerts of the world. But I, I don't feel the presence of God in a lot of what I see. What good is it to have numbers in church when people are rejecting the Holy Spirit of God in their life? So my prayer for this body, for each of you, is the same prayer, the same three things that Jabez prayed for. Oh, that you would bless me, Lord. My prayer for you is that you are richly, richly blessed. That you will send out praise and worship to God before every battle. That God will expand your territory, your spiritual territory. That you will love bigger. That you will forgive bigger. That your desire to serve and worship God will be bigger and expansive. And that it will continue to grow all the days of your life. And I pray that the hand of God is on every one of your lives. That God is protecting you, watching you, and keeping you as He does all of His children. But my prayer for you guys is that the hand of God would touch your life and wake up the dormant things that God has called you to do over the years, long before we all got together as a church family, but all of the callings that God has put on your heart when you were young men and women, all of the leadings, all of the ideas that came into your and into your life and into your, into your mind and you knew they were from God and maybe you went and wrote them down. Maybe God gave you a vision of how something could be, but it's been so long ago, you don't remember how the dream went. My prayer is that when the hand of God is on your life and touches you, that it will begin to wake up all of those dormant spiritual areas and that you will once again become alive in Christ. That you will know who you are in Christ. So that the Lord would bless you. The Lord would expand all your spiritual territory that His hand would be on you and that He would protect you from the fiery darts of the enemy for the rest of your life. That you will have spiritual shields around you. And the Bible tells us how we do that. 
We do that by putting on the full armor of God. So just from these few little verses in Scripture, and I, for time's sake, uh, I cut it by three quarters. Uh, that's why it, se- it seemed a little... Uh, but I'm just saying, I, I cut it back for time's sake because I, I know that the weather's bad and, and some of you travel, but uh, I just want to say, I hope that you take away from this message to send praise out and worship out to God first. Every day, no matter what your circumstance. I pray that you come boldly before the throne of God and and dare to pray bold prayers and ask God, like Jabez did, a man of honor, that you would ask God to bless you, expand your territory, keep His hand on you, and protect you all of, of, of your days. Because we have work to do. When God led us here, everybody thought I was crazy uh, because, you know, uh, when you're going to start any sort of a business, you go to the, the big, you go to Franklin or you go to places like that. And when we were praying about where to start, Servant's Heart, God kept leading Linda and I here. And, and there was nothing here. It was a gas station and a waffle house. But I was saying, surely, Lord, you don't mean that you're leading us to start a church here. And the Lord said, yes, I am. And don't call me surely. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> no. So he said, yes. I knew that I knew that I knew that this was a spot. So we began looking for places that we could rent. We go down here. There's a little strip mall on the left and a little strip mall on the right. I went to the little strip mall on the right because I saw a cross on a window. And I walked into that place. And they said, it's vacant. There was a church here. They just left. It's ready for you to come on in. They had a kitchen. They had nine classrooms. They had a rec center that would be great for youth. They had a, a sanctuary area set up with a little riser, a stage. They had all the wiring in for the sound system. They had everything we need. And I just knew that God had led us there. And I was like, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Lord. I said, I'm not feeling it, Linda. I'm not, I'm not getting that word. Let's go look at the other place. The other place is empty. It's in foreclosure. The tiles are hanging off and wires are coming out of the wall. There's not even any electricity where we could see it. I called the number on the window and the guy came down. He says, well, if we, I can rent it to you, but we can only, you have to get out in five days if, if we need you out because it's in foreclosure and they may repossess at any time. Surely, Lord, <laughs> this isn't the place. And God lit me up. Yes, it is. But Lord, I can't do anything with it. That's why I want you here. Because I don't need you to do anything but follow my lead. So we went into the foreclosed place and a bunch of us got together and Doug brought his tools and some wood and we made that church, that little place, a church. And we had those two suites. We were there for four years. Souls got saved in that place. Lives were changed in that place. It was totally not what I would have done. I say all that to say this. Even through all that, there was still nothing here. But if you look around today, God gave us the miracle of this land. We could never build on this land. There was something written in the deed. And at one o'clock in the morning, after pouring through all the deeds, Linda and I found something. The Lord led us to something. And we found out that we actually could build here. So we bought it. And praise God, we closed escrow. And, and we were able to build. And look what God does. There's a church here filled with people who love one another. And all around us right now, you can hear the saws and the hammers. And you can hear the concrete trucks. And you can hear the backup alarms 
beeping because in every direction around this church there is building happening. Single family homes. The harvest is white. God is doing something in this area and He wants to do something with this church. That's why I say, let the praise go out before you. We've got a battle to fight. Things are, the devil is going to be coming down hard and he's going to be trying to get us to feel defeated. But we need as a church to take the posture of a crouching lion ready. We need to take the posture of praising God, letting that hand of God go out in the spiritual world and grab Satan by the neck and shake him and say, get out of here. You have no authority here. When we know who we are in Christ and we're willing to dare to pray bold prayers, stuff that we couldn't even imagine that God is going to do through this place long after we're gone. If we have that kind of vision, Lord, it's about you. It's not about me. It's not about any singular person, person, but it's about laying a foundation to last until the Lord returns. If we have that, I, that kind of idea, uh, and attitude in our heart, then God will do great things. But right now, We've got a little bit of a respite because these houses are starting to be occupied. People are starting to move in. There's a Costco coming right down the road. There's a Walmart and a Kroger, I believe, coming to Neapolis. There's a lot of things happening right here. And God had called us into this, which was a wilderness. Because in this wilderness... All around this wilderness, God knew that the promised land was going to come. And He wanted us ready when it was ready. So we have got to get ourselves ready. Amen? Amen.